And I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I think we have a very thought-provoking evening. Uh, the program tonight is supported by a major endowment. The Schusterman Distinguished Scholar Lecture Series is dedicated to bringing outstanding programs to Gratz College. And Gratz College expresses its profound gratitude to Murray Schusterman and his late wife, Judith Schusterman, for their generosity and foresight. And Murray and his son, Bob, are here tonight with us. Do you want to wave? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary and Bob. I have um, the great pleasure and honor tonight of introducing a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Scott White. Uh, it's kind of odd because I have his um, official bio here, but I know his unofficial bio. So what I'll do is I'll read the official bio with some editorial comments by me <laughs> to give you a little bit more of an insight into our, our um, speaker tonight. So Dr. Scott White um, is a criminologist and an associate clinical professor at Drexel University here in Philadelphia. And he holds a BA in psychology and political science from York University in Toronto and an MA in political studies with a concentration in terrorism from the University of Guelph, also in Canada. And he has a PhD in criminology from the University of Bristol in England. You can tell he's kind of Anglo and Canadian, right? And if he says A a lot in the, uh, during, the, um, during the talk, just raise your hand and make him stop. Um, Dr. White holds it, uh, so wait, it gets better. He holds a Queen's Commission and was an officer with the Canadian Forces uh, Intelligence Command. Uh, and I can tell you that he, was, uh, he had active duty during the Bosnian War in Bosnia. And I'm going to say this, even though I think he's going to cringe. He was seconded to the UN forces in Bosnia and saw a lot of uh, very highly genocidal activity there, which I think he's going to include in his talk tonight. Um, uh, in addition, following his PhD, uh, Dr. White was an intelligence officer with the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, which is the equivalent to like our CIA here in the United States. In 2010, Dr. White joined MONAD, a security audit system, as an associate consultant, where his interests are in counterterrorism, ter intelligence, and infrastructure uh, protection. Uh, Dr. White has consulted with a variety of law enforcement agencies in the areas of behavioral analysis and as it relates to terrorism and ideologically based crime. Um, Dr. White won't say this, but I'll tell you that he is an expert in um, psychopathy and in uh, what we would call, um, what do you call it, when you profile, criminal profiling, especially when it comes to hate crimes. Uh, today, Dr. White is an associate clinical professor and director of the Computing and Security Technology Program at Drexel. Um, so all of that, he looks very young. So <laughs> I will introduce to you uh, Scott White. Good evening, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you here tonight. Um, those, those always sound much more impressive than they really are. Uh, I know me, and I'm really not that impressive. Um, I, uh, I dropped out of school at 15 for a little while. I thought being on the road would be more applicable. Uh, and then uh, when I went back to school and ended up at university, um, I was uh, almost kicked out of my first year on academic probation. So as I stand before you today as a professor, I, I will say that uh, there is redemption and we do get better. Um, but just on a personal note, I mean, it, it, I, um, I came about this a very interesting way, got into the field I am. I, I uh, have two very lovely parents. Um, uh, my parents met when my mom was working for the top civil rights lawyer in Canada, equivalent of Mr. Kunstler here in the U.S., a guy named Clayton Ruby, as a paralegal, and my father was in, uh, in school studying commerce, a business degree. Um, so they had two completely opposite type people. So my older brother is a, uh, is a businessman, a marketing director, and makes more money in his bonus than I make in my salary. And yet every year he votes Labour in Canada. He votes for the Labour Party which doesn't make sense. Both my younger sisters, both my younger sisters are ardent conservatives, but work for the National Health Service and would work for nobody else. So it's a very schizophrenic type family, and 
when I um, when I uh, started in psychology, my mom was very happy. Uh, and then I went on to my master's and started studying terrorism, and mom got somewhat concerned. And then I went and joined the army in the intelligence unit. And I believe the words similar were fascist puppet of the establishment, I think was the terminology that may have been said. When I left the military, she was once again excited I was going back to university. Uh, and when I came back, I joined the security intelligence service, at which time my mother truly knew that she had lost me as a child and was banking on my siblings. Uh, so I come to this honestly, this field, um, and uh, I'd like to begin this evening um, by just going through a bit of history for us. Now this history for most of you will uh, be germane and yet at the same time be somewhat redundant, but I think it's important that we begin uh, at the beginning for what we see. And as I say, today we're going to be looking at, and the title is The Politics of Tolerance and the Ambiguity of Genocide in the Modern Age. Uh, how I came about this, uh, we'll talk as we move through. So let's, let us begin. So it's important to understand for us that the Holocaust did not begin with gas chambers, but rather with a culture of hate. Although the primary catalyst was hate, hate alone cannot explain the deaths of over six million souls. Ultimately, the genocide of European Jewry then succeeded because of indifference in silence and the politics of tolerance from the west of Europe and North America. Hitler's government, it must be remembered that Hitler did not gain a majority government, but rather linked his National Socialist Party with the Nationalist Conservatives at the time. And the Nazis entered power uh, based on economics, on a campaign of economics and trashing the Treaty of Versailles, and not on hate and racism and xenophobia. Ultimately, however, as we well know, that was the core basis of Nazism. Nazism is deeply, deeply racist. Uh, however, their power could not have come about if it were not for the law. The law in isolation. Many laws were passed in Germany with the key focus of isolating German Jewry. Isolating them from public life, from the operations of law and government and inevitably business. The violence of Kristallnacht in 38, as we are well aware of, was not authorized by the Nazis per se, but it was thinly veiled as accepted by the party. We knew very well in North America and in Western Europe what was going on behind that particular curtain at that time. But German anti-Semitism was cloaked in the law. And it is widely trumpeted that the law existed for the purpose of social hygiene. But in reality, we knew the underlying message of it. This early legislation then, properly passed in law, enacted an international, or rather enacted by an internationally recognized government, the government of Germany at the time, was the real start of the Holocaust. For without the legislation defining the isolation of German Jewry, the Holocaust itself could have never happened. We know very well based on our own history, how it propagated throughout much of Germany. The elevation of key figures, the promotion of certain plans, and ultimately the camp structure was well defined by, our, uh, by the Germans at that time. The Holocaust, however, in itself, managed to isolate most of the Jews in Germany at that time. And although there was a cloak of silence, it was very well known what was going on in Germany at that time. Let us state by clarifying the terms, both genocide and holocaust. From my perspective, there is only one. There is one holocaust. There are multiple genocides. The holocaust termed in the 1960s again, Following your, our history, we are well defined on how the term came about. 
But more importantly, it is important to know that because of the absolute genocidal nature of the Holocaust, it makes it a very unique part of mass murder and genocide in history. Therefore, I am reticent to refer to anything else as the Holocaust of Rwanda or the Holocaust of. There is a singular Holocaust. It was a mechanism. It was designed by government and it was implemented by a well-structured state. It was defined. It was a final solution. And that in itself, the annihilation of an entire people, of an entire culture, of an entire being, represents a Holocaust as opposed to genocide. This applies, as I say, when we move into the uh, United Nations conventions post-war, we begin to look at the various conventions and agreements as we came out and realized that we had witnessed probably one of the worst, utterly the worst thing in mankind was the death of six million souls and better. The United Nations moved quickly to create the United Nations Convention for the Prevention and Punishments of Crimes of Genocide, the UNGC, which we now just refer to as the Genocide Convention. It was then up to signatory states to sign this convention into being. So, for example, in my own country, the Criminal Code of Canada introduced sections 318, 319, and 320 of the Criminal Code which outlaws the advocation of genocide. To advocate genocide in Canada is a crime. We believe, as we hope others will, that the advocation of genocide is itself language that does not require protection. The First Amendment exists to protect speech which we do not like. It does not exist to protect speech that we do like. However, societally, there are speech there are forms of speech that does not deserve the protection of law. The advocation of mass murder, genocide, or a holocaust again is not language worth protecting. And the Canadian government has so instituted that through 318, 319, 320, and through the Sentencing Act of 720 for sentencing. It is the implementation of the Genocide Act, or rather the Convention, into domestic law. That then becomes the very interesting thing for us, that we have many signatures to the law that had the convention rather that have not brought that legislation into domestic politics. And that is where we must continue to work to bring states into compliance with the very act and conventions that they have signed. Herein lies the first part of our problem, that when we do not have states who see the value in implementing this type of legislation into their own domestic accords, we have the beginnings of this uh, applied knowledge that is not implemented correctly. Genocide defined today. Definitions of genocide, Article 2 of the Genocide Convention is very clear. Genocide means the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, to hold in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And we define the acts as we do in law, for any of my colleagues in the audience that practice uh, the discipline of law. There are certain conditions that must be met, the killing of members of a group, the causing of serious bodily or mentally harm to members of that group, the deliberate infliction of that group to conditions which uh, are deemed to bring about the physical destruction of that group, the imposition of measures intended to prevent birth within that group, the forcible transferring of children, for example, from one group to another. Now, all know, although the law has been in place since 1951, due to domestic opposition in the United States, only signed to the Senate in 1988. So from 1951, we bring out the Convention on Genocide, and in 1988, the United States ratifies and brings that into code. Quite frankly, that is unacceptable for a leader, a world leader. But it just shows you if the United States is ill-prepared to bring and ratify the genocide code until 1988, what then are the lesser countries prepared or not prepared to do for us? 
Seventy years have passed, and we continue to ignore the lessons those six million souls taught us so long ago. In the last few decades, we have witnessed institutionalized indifference and inactions that have once again taken us to the unthinkable. Ethnic cleansing in the Balkans and the preventative genocidal conduct in Rwanda and Darfur. The strong and compelling words condemn the practice of genocide shall not happen again and promise punishment to those who might conspire to do away with one group based on race, ethnic, religious, or political persuasion. While the words never again rang out internationally after the discovery in 1945 of the extent to the crimes that the Germans had committed upon European Jewry, the international community was slow in recognizing and coming to grips that we still have these periods of genocidal conduct. Frequently, and we see this coming to, to, to fruition, but historically, since 1945, we have seen East Pakistan in the Bangladesh area. We have seen the genocide in East Timor, in Cambodia, in Guatemala, of course, in Bosnia Herzegovina, Rwanda, Zaire, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and most recently in the Sudan's Darfur region. This is a mere sample of the modern day cases of genocide or what some are just referring to are cases of mass murder. There are currently registered 79 countries worldwide that have been guilty of genocidal conduct. 79. I dare say that most of us will not see those on the evening news, but we will see that the president of FIFA has resigned. It is often the priorities that uh, endanger us the most. I've highlighted a few for us tonight. In Cambodia, a genocide was carried by the Khmer Rouge. Paul Potts, Maoist doctrine of returning people to an agrarian society. The difficulty here, the killing fields of Vietnam, or Cambodia rather, the difficulty is, and I've said to most people before, and I've said it to my friends from the Palestine region, that when young people begin to vilify and hate others with such, such passion, that anger and passion can quickly turn upon their parents. When you create a generation of young people that hate and feel, feel validated in hatred and genocidal conduct, then watch out that someday they will come for you when you do not also meet their doctrine. This is very apparent in what we see with groups, and we'll talk about them a little later, such as ISIS and the Caliphate. When you create a society of young people that worship death, when you create a society of people that can take a whole society, a whole group of individuals, and vilify them, hatred, despising them for what they are, for what they believe, for who they are. It is a small bridge across this very small river that will take you to hatred toward yourself. This is not in the best interests of our friends in the Palestinian region, for example, to continue to vilify our friends in Israel. But Cambodia and the killing fields of Cambodia were a recent example, but still, quite a few years ago, from 75 to 79. Now, for our generation, that's well within the confines. One of the problems we have is within the confines of today's young people. Over dinner this, tonight, my colleague Rosalie asked me, what do I think is the greatest threat? One of the greatest threats, I think, is apathy. When I see young Israelis who do not truly understand the Holocaust, when I see young Israelis who do not remember the Seven Days War, when I see young Israelis who do not remember the past and advocate for a different world, a, a, a world in which they fully do not understand their adversary, that becomes a danger, I believe. Off topic slightly, we've seen that in the United States in the last year. When the United States gives up its hegemony in the Middle East to others, a vacuum is created and we have ISIS and the creation of ISIS. 
People of good faith and good conduct must stand always tall, educating those around us of these issues. But Cambodia was one, but one of several. The killing fields of Cambodia saw the loss of one and a half to three million souls. Almost 20% of the Cambodian population was lost in the genocide in Cambodia. It was only stopped when the Vietnamese invade, invaded Cambodia. But the killing fields came across multiple mass graves, 20, 30, 40,000 people. And it was well documented by people at the time. They knew and observed the torture, the murders, the crimes against humanity in their country. We move on to an area that I know a little bit about, and that is Bosnia-Herzegovina, or the Bosnia. The Bosnian genocide, as we refer to it today, really acknowledges the acts of genocide in Zepa and Srebrenica. Committed by Bosnian Serb forces in 1995, and the wider ethnic cleansing campaign throughout Bosnia, controlled by, at the time, the Army of the Republic of Bosnia, uh, which is more, which was nothing more than a militia. These were the present-day brown shirts and black shirts of Bosnia. The events of Srebrenica in '95 included the killing of close to 8,000 Bosniak or Bosnian Muslims, men and young boys, as well as the mass expulsion of nearly 25,000 to maybe 35,000 Bosnian civilians in around the town of Srebrenica and the Bosnia proper, Herzegovina. The units of the army of the, of the, uh, the VRS, as they were known, uh, were under the control of then uh, General Ratko Mladic, who uh, was later arrested on crimes of genocide. But the ethnic cleansing, these pictures can look, these, to me, these pictures can be easily 1945, but they were not. They were 1995. And the ethnic cleansing campaign that took place throughout the area, controlled by the Bosnian Serbs, which were majority Orthodox, through the VRS, targeted Bosniaks, which were majorly Muslims, and of course, Bosnian Croats, which were Catholic. The ethnic cleansing campaign included unlawful confinement, targeting of individuals, rape, sex, torture, beatings, robbery, and ultimately homicide. <coughs> these, were, these atrocities were committed against civilians and not uh, combating uh, force of, of soldiers. The unlawful deportation and transfer of civilians and the unlawful shelling of civilians and the unlawful shelling of United Nations peacekeepers as well uh, was the real issue that we see the, 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 the crimes that did occur. And they were blatant about it. Uh, they had no problem bombing the UN bases from the mountainsides. In the 1990s, several authorities uh, considered um, whether we actually had a genocide in Bosnia, and some determined that accordingly in law, the conditions of Bosnia did not equate to genocide. Some courts in the United States, some courts in Europe, refused outright to acknowledge that what we saw in Bosnia was indeed a genocide, perhaps what we saw was mass homicide, but in itself failed to meet the conditions of genocide. As someone who was there, I will acknowledge to you that if it is not genocide, then I don't know what it was. We have to be cognizant that legal definitions cannot be the only determinant for making a determination of such a societal crime. In 2005, the United States Congress finally passed a resolution declaring that the Serbian policies of aggression and ethnic cleansing met the terms defined in genocide. So we debated for 10 years whether the Serbian actions were deemed to be genocidal. Uh, and yet we had several thousand bodies piled up and several thousand people deported. These inconsistencies 
make it difficult for those people working in this area and on the front lines to advocate properly for the appropriate condition. And as we see in this quick slide, many, many articles were written after the fact uh, acknowledging what a poor job uh, we had done in the West. When we initially went to Bosnia as peacekeepers, it was blue berets, light armament, and white vehicles. We were there to police peace, a peace that the Serbians and Croats and Muslims necessarily did not want to see. It was very difficult at the time because we want to acknowledge an enemy, but it was very difficult to find one. The Balkans had a long history of violence and a United Nations peacekeeping force of French, Canadians and British were not going to change a thousand years of history. Nevertheless, an attempt was made to bring peace to a region that we found was really void of peace. It is the first time we saw, we saw the Mushahideen had left Afghanistan and had come to Bosnia in 92 to assist the Bosnian Muslims in building IEDs. The first explosive devices, improvised explosive devices we saw were not Iraq. The first we saw were in Bosnia in 92. And these were roadside devices hidden in children's toys and in foodstuffs, anything that someone would pick up. It was a violence that we in the United States and in the West in general are not conditioned to. However, in the line, the majority of legal scholars in the end, international, the International Crime, tri, uh, Criminal Tribunal, excuse, excuse me, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, I just refer to it as ICTY, um, that's because I'm dyslexic and city is uh, similar to that. Um, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, have ruled that in fact uh, there is enough evidence now to support to support criminal charges uh, for genocide. The very interesting thing is that gentlemen uh, such as Radovan Karavic was protected in Serbia up to a couple of years ago. For those who are following the world court and, uh, and this action, uh, when he returned to Serbia he was a rock star. He was well loved and he was well protected. His compound was guarded by Serbian soldiers and secret police officers who guarded him as a national war hero. A couple of years ago, the uh, Serbian government decided that it wanted to join the European Union. And it approached the European Union for entry, and the Europeans said, yes, we can entertain that. But first, we have this 20-year-old warrant for the arrest of Radovan Karavic and a couple others we would like to execute. And at that time, they gave him up. So he was an international hero until the economy in Serbia tanked and they wanted to join the EU. Since that time, however, seven more people have been arrested in, in Serbia and are currently up on charges in domestic court in Serbia in Serbia's attempt to clean its past history, which it cannot. From Serbia, we moved to Rwanda. Rwanda was inevitably controlled uh, by a United Nations force headed up by a Canadian, a French-Canadian gentleman, who eventually suffered post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, became a Canadian senator. Those two are not exclusive. <laughs> um, Romeo Dallaire, General Dallaire, it's, it's an often common practice in Canada uh, that the government sends an English Canadian to one venture and then the second venture a French Canadian. So uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina it was Major General Louis Mackenzie and in Rwanda it was uh, Lieutenant General Dallaire. Uh, Dallaire was there with the Belgian contingency and if we uh, remember the, um, the Be Belgian paratroopers that gave up their firearms um, and, uh, and eventually were killed in Rwanda. Um, again, a mass, uh, a mass genocide uh, uh, with proportions that we had not seen in many years. The Rwandan genocide was most definitely the mass slaughter of Tutsis by uh, uh, moderate Hutus 
um, and uh, in, in some cases even in Tutsis. Um, during the approximate, uh, roughly about 100 day period in April of 1994, uh, around July, the summer months, it is estimated that some 500,000 to 1 million Rwandans were killed and this constituted just over 20% of the country's total population and 70% of the Tutsi people living in Rwanda, a genocide of immense scale. It was planned by members of the core political elite in Rwanda, the Ezek, many of whom occupied positions of high-level national government. And once again, these were implemented by the predominantly uh, Tutsi-controlled Rwandan army. We are cognizant of this. Along, along with the army, we had the gendarmerie, the national police force, which was government-backed also with the intelligence services in Rwanda. We in the West were fully cognizant of what was going on in Rwanda. We allowed it to continue, and then we sent in a very small contingent of underprepared and uh, under-equipped uh, United Nations peacekeepers. So finally, when we do see a genocide, the West tends to acts. It acts too late and too little. The genocide took place in the context of the Rwandan Civil War, and for many, that became uh, a cloak in saying that this was not a genocidal activity, this was the product of war. And we heard that in 1939 to 1945 in Germany as well. The Rwandan Patriotic Front, or the RPF, which is the largest group composed by Tutsis, and their families fled to Uganda. Uh, ways of Tutu violence against the Tutsis uh, continued, and the international pressure, pressure rather, on, on the Hutu-led government uh, finally to have a ceasefire in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a couple of years, a year or so after that, which brought uh, the violence uh, to, a, to, a, to a, a close, but not before we had seen incredible uh, levels of, of homicide and mass murder, and ultimately, as we say, a, a genocide of people. The genocide was a profound act in the Rwandans, and of course, we saw a spillover in the neighboring countries. People are unaware that as a result of the genocide in Rwanda, we saw a radical spike in HIV infections uh, including uh, babies born of rape uh, to infected mothers. Um, so we uh, now have many children as head of households in Rwanda. But it is the ripple effects of genocide, if nothing else, should alert uh, our governments to act. If not for the domestic people, the, the people of the country, then for ourselves in how we handle these things. We have just dealt with an Ebola crisis where we have sent over the military and doctors to West Africa, and if you're going to your doctors or dentists, will be asked the question, have you been to one of the following countries? We are cognizant that the Ebola virus, as the SARS virus, as so many of these, have the ability to cross geographic boundaries. The effects of genocidal conduct in a country also has the effect to spill over into other countries and cause problems elsewhere as well. Rwandan genocide eventually, we have arrests made, people sent to jail. But it's an interesting fact that most people in government who engage in this type of conduct have very little fear of the international repercussions. In fact, the international, international courts have very little teeth to act. So most people who engage and advocate for genocidal conduct do with a certain amount of... Uh, of, of um, uh, acceptance, uh, or rather, of um, anonymity, or uh, uh, rather, that they will f they will not feel the direct effects of their conduct um, after the event. Um, so, in this case, as we saw in Bosnia Herzegovina, as we saw in Cambodia, as we see here, as we see so many times over, people do not fear uh, the repercussions of engaging in this conduct, and ultimately, it is only the very few that suffer their conduct. We arrest a president or a prime minister. We arrest a general. Uh, but that's it. Where are the countless thousands that operationalize this? When we look at uh, Germany and we hear things like 
They've just arrested an 89-year-old prison guard, and we hear, why are they picking on an old man? Because at one time, he was a young man and engaging in crimes that were uh, of a genocidal nature and beyond our scope of humanity. So these criminals must always be hunted down. The location, their age is irrelevant. Their conduct is, and that is what we must prosecute. Ultimately, Darfur is the last one that we're looking at here tonight. The Darfur region of Sudan that began in February of 2003 uh, by the Sudanese Liberation Movement um, and the, uh, 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 the Justice and Equity Movement or the GEM rebel movement groups fighting in the Sudan. Um, here we see again uh, mass uh, exodus of people, a conflagration, we see homicide, rape, all of the same things that we saw in Rwanda and again under the guise of conflict and under the guise of military exercises. These people then become enemies of the state and as such once deemed to be so they are, uh, they are uh, at, the, uh, at the whim or at the, uh, the persecution of the existing uh, military structure. So ultimately then, why? Why is it that we do not engage? We do not engage in hostilities with other countries because in ourselves we do not want to engage. Top leaders in democracies are embroiled in their own domestic politics and fear the quagmire once they have committed to a foreign operation. We have just left Iraq and Afghanistan, or leaving Afghanistan, and we've been there for over 10 years. There is a fear in domestic politics that we will engage in these conflicts and we will be there for a very long time. In reality, this is a fear for most politicians. The other issue that we run into is a fear that we, in fact, will destabilize the region, when in fact, we perhaps did it in Iraq. We destabilized it with perhaps good intentions, but inevitably it was destabilized, leading to the Ba'ath Party members eventually creating ISIS, which we'll talk about shortly. But the cost of intervention, as we saw in both Yugoslavia and Rwanda, in terms of strategic instability and the endless new structures and costs to the international community were high. But were they high enough? Did they represent beyond something higher than perhaps we should have had? Should we have not been there earlier and intervened earlier? There is this morass, this fear, this, this idea that once we enter these countries into these pursuits, we will become amassed in them and be there for a long time. There is also this idea amongst democratic leaders that we do not want to intervene in another country, for that country has its own sovereign state and its own sovereign laws. And this was the situation in Kosovo, where we did not want to enter the country, for we felt that it was an illegal venture. In fact, entering Kosovo was actually an illegal venture in international law but we believed it prevented what we were going to see in Bosnia, what we saw rather in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. But it is this indifference, this attitude that we cannot be involved in the sovereign nations, that we, we do not extend our arm and our justice to them. So we stand back and we watch as we did in 1939, actually prior to 1939, as the world watched uh, German Jewry become isolated, uh, become disenfranchised, becoming bankrupted by its lawful government. We continually see this, these actions uh, from 1945 until today. And yet, at the same time, we have civil servants who themselves are the ones that see this coming and are rarely, uh, if any, engaging their political masters in directing them to these issues. And this inherent, inherently is a major flaw. Ultimately, we come full circle. We're going to continue, but here we come full circle in this concept as we now find uh, it quite easily to blame Israel for the issues in the Middle East. That if only Israel would, 
do something, if only Israel did this, if only... Well, Israel has tried for many years. The land for peace has been tried on several occasions, has failed. But there is this idea now that we can blame the victim readily. And that is what we see in Israel. We see it predominantly in the United States, coming out of this government, and in Western Europe, where we continually see that the direction to peace is being somehow molested by the Israeli government, um, which is an absolute fallacy. But we see it. We have young people talk about it. We have school teachers teaching it. And again, my fear in a global world is that when this becomes the new reality, uh, then, we, then the people of Israel are definitely in, in, in dire straits. So we must continue always to stand behind our friends in Israel and let them know that they are, that they are just in their pursuits. The problem, however, of international, to the international community that faces and prevention, faces genocide and attempts to prevent genocide is not insurmountable. However, they first must identify what they are going to do and how they are going to do it. They need to find in the vast United Nations conventions, they need to find that legitimacy to act and act quickly. Not only in their own legislation, but in those conventions that we sign, whether it be the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which has a variety of conventions therein, or the United Nations itself. We are signatories to enough conventions worldwide that there must be some piece of legislation that would enable us to prevent genocide in a country. From an international perspective, I want to quickly look at the area of domestic terrorism, an area that I have spent a lot of time in my career looking into. More so than ever, domestic terrorism is becoming a threat, more so than ever, and we have seen this, and we have seen the radicalizations of these lone individuals. I dare say I don't really like to call them lone wolves because that has a certain sex appeal to it. Um, they are mad individuals who uh, subscribe to a, a genocidal philosophy. There is nothing endearing about them. But these people are amongst us now. They act. They are recruited. They are tech savvy. They are learning as quickly as we find an IP address in the ether, in the computing world. Uh, we shut it down. Another one starts within 24 hours. The message is clear, the message is directed toward young people. It says if you are marginalized, if you want to join a bigger cause than yourself, if you want to leave isolation and be someone, here is the direction. It is absolute madness that we see young people uh, leaving their homes and their families attempting to fly over to Syria to join these individuals. The young women are quickly find themselves being married and raped by these uh, ISIS leaders. But there are three issues that I want to quickly address within the concept of domestic terrorism that we are cognizant of and that we must be cognizant of. The first one is that of isolation. Isolation represents a key component to the indoctrination of young people. The military has used this for many years in its training. It's off to boot camp you go surrounded by military people. There's a sense of isolation. You're not necessarily accessible to your cell phone for several weeks. You are in the community. The isolation process here begins with members being sequestered from their previous identities and memories. Members sometimes receive even new names. They leave their families and friends. Those people then vilified. They are no longer part of your new life. This is a uh, ostensibly the beginnings of, uh, of, of turning an individual into uh, something that the organization wants and this isolationism is the first key. The communal living, living with only people who accept a certain radical ideology. It is important to remember that often we see people who are now subscribing to radical Islam and I have no hesitation in using that phrase, radical or extreme Islam. These individuals are recent converts and only truly taking parts of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad's uh, most violent uh, parts of it. As a, as a Christian, 
I only have to look at parts of the Old Testament. Uh, I know uh, my family was, uh, my parents actually very much liked the part about disobedient children being taken to the gates of the city and being stoned. Um, I think uh, that my father had probably prescribed to that one uh, if he could have. But nevertheless, um, there are uh, passages of every religious doctrine that are going to have violence in them. But none of us who have faith and uh, believe in a higher power truly believe all elements of those. They are, they are metaphors, they are similes, they are written in a time for us, they are stories. I often tell people that it's interesting that we often, we often hear uh, the conservative right in the United States talk about the Ten Commandments. We must protect the Ten Commandments. Well, six of them have to do with, uh, with uh, God, and only four of them have to do with moral conduct. So, it's important to understand that when these young people join these groups, the first thing we do is, they, do is, they do is isolate them. Isolate them from their family. Isolate them from the true word of their religion. The second part of that we have is projection. It's a true pronged process. First, the group projects responsibility for its decisions and its directions onto a specific leader. And we see this in ISIS now with the caliphate itself. Second, the group projects the cause it perceives its grievance on its, what it's grieving to. The outside source for ISIS, it is uh, the heretics that are backing the Western government and anyone who truly does not believe in their warped and uh, disgusting uh, interpretation of the Quran. Finally, we have an area that I am somewhat cognizant of, and that is the mental health element, which is the pathology of anger. This is the final and most lethal part of the triad, is the pathology of anger, which in isolation and with projection grows. Collectively, members uh, begin to uh, see themselves as victims and project outwards incredible levels of violence, and that is ultimately what we are seeing now in the Middle East with ISIS. And finally, this evening, we have ISIS, or ISIL, depends on... Uh, on uh, what, uh, what you'd like. It's the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant or the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Um, this organization is truly one of the most heinous organizations that we've seen. As someone who practiced clinical criminology and understanding mental health, if we looked at Dr. Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist, the 20-point checklist of Dr. Robert Hare on the on a psychopathist, we definitely see uh, a great many of these points evident in the leaders of, these, of this movement. We are dealing with homicidal murderers and schizophrenics. We are dealing with people who have definitive mental illness here. And yet, they have managed to gain great ground throughout the Middle East and uh, represent, ultimately, uh, a faction and a fear that we in the West must be cognizant of. Whether we address them in the Middle East or we will address them here, that's a decision for our politicians. I will say this, that ISIS will come to the shores of the United States and to Canada, as it has already come to uh, Western Europe. So, ultimately then, we cannot stand by that we as citizens of the world, that we as good people of good conduct, have to stand up when we see the beginnings of this conduct and make it very clear to our politicians that this is something that we as a society need to be involved in. That we cannot stand by and watch the genocide of millions. We did that between 1939 and 1945, and we have done that from 1945 to 2015. Ultimately, as someone who has studied hate and been involved in either studying it, teaching it, reading about it, or operationalizing the arrests of those who engage in it, let me say that it is still rampant in our society. We use different words today. We use words like xenophobia. We use words like cultural identity. We use words like, I am just have pride in my own culture. Those words were the same words that echoed between 1930 and 1939. On that note, I will conclude the formal part of my lecture this evening. I thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope it was informative for some of you. Hopefully it was informative for all of you. Um.